critically important. Um, the standards say that the auditors have to respond to the risk of fraud. They have to respond to risk. Just the same way with the audit risk model, what's the auditor's response to their assessment based on the audit risk model? How do they respond? Right. They, 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 uh, they, based on the audit risk model, right, they're going to set audit risk at moderate or low. So they're going to say, auditors say, I want, I'm only willing to accept moderate risk. I'm willing to accept the moderate risk that um, I will issue an incorrect opinion, right? That's what audit risk is. That the risk that the auditor issues an incorrect opinion. How do they respond to that? So how do they achieve moderate risk? What do they do? That's the response. What do they have to do so that they achieve moderate risk? How do they go about achieving that? Right, so they, they adjust the audit risk model. That's their response. The na remember this, nature, timing, and extent of your audit procedures is your response to your risk assessment. So if you want to keep risk low, right, if you want your audit risk to be low, then you're going to change the nature of the tests you perform, the extent of the tests that you perform, and the timing. So if you want to keep your audit risk low, and your client has ineffective internal controls, what would your response be? Increase the time of searching through their documents. Right, so you would change your timing. So for one thing, you might not look at internal controls at, at, at interim, right? You might, not, you, might not, you, you might not rely on, you probably won't rely on internal controls. So if you don't rely on internal controls, that means that you're going to have to do more substantive testing. Right, you're going to have to look at a lot more transactions, a lot more documents. Right, so you've increased the extent of the testing that you're doing and the nature of the testing. So instead of saying we're going to rely on internal controls, we'll do test of controls, and then we'll do some substantive testing, you're going to shift to doing nothing but substantive testing because you can't rely on the internal controls. So the auditor's response to their risk assessment is the nature, the timing, and extent of audit procedures they perform. And that's the same thing with fraud, right? Your audit, you, the, essentially what the auditors do, based on their fraud risk assessment, is they change the nature or address the fraud risk by the nature, the timing, and the extent of the audit procedures that they're performing. It's in, it's in those areas where they've identified there's a higher risk of fraud. So for example, if the auditor determines that there's a higher risk of fraud um, uh, in the sales and collection cycle because there's not an adequate segregation of duties, there's no management oversight, then the auditors will say, well, one, we can't rely on internal controls, but we're going to have to do a lot more testing as well. So we're going to have to do a lot more testing of those transactions. For example, if the auditors say, you know, they do have effective controls, however, that, you know, they have effective operating controls, however, management has a temperament or an approach where they're overriding controls or they're dominant, that increases the fraud risk. So the auditors will say, even though controls are effective, we can rely on, we're still going to want to look at some uh, we're going to want to look at more transactions. We're going to want to focus our effort in those areas where management is likely to override internal controls. So those transactions that would be affected by that decision. So the, basically that's their response to audit risk. Uh, the, ri 